quenched. Verse number three says, and he called the name of the place Taborah because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? So now the man is not enough. They're saying, oh, we need flesh. Now, now I want to eat some flesh. And they, they go and reminisce of Egypt. Verse number five, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. Freely. Oh, I don't think you were very free when you were in Egypt. How quickly you forget the bad times and the bondage and the slavery that you're under in Egypt. And all you remember now is, oh man, the food was just so good. We could just eat fish whenever we wanted to. We could have all these spices. They bring up here the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Oh, we had it so good in Egypt. And now that we're following the Lord, you know, it's just so bad. We've got now well, all we have is this manna. And they despised the food that God was providing for them. And started lusting after anything else. Everything else. What they used to have when they were in slavery. Verse number six says, but now our soul is dried away. Oh, you poor people, you sound so bad. After God's freed you from a life of hardship and slavery and being beaten by your taskmasters and being worked to the bone and given unreasonable demands... Now your soul is just dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Funny how not that long ago they were saying how great it was that God was providing for them. Now it just turns into disdain for what God has given them. Watch out for this attitude. This happens all the time. People get real excited about maybe it's a material thing, a material possession. You get a new car or a new house or something like that. And you're so excited. Wow. Praise God. Thank you, God, for blessing us so much. Oh, man, this is awesome. This is great. And then it turns into, oh, well, it's only got this or it's only got that. And you start looking at other things and bigger and better things. And you get your heart, have a covetous heart on things that you don't have. And now things that you want. And all of a sudden, what you had already previously thanked God for and were thankful for. Now, all of a sudden, you're disdaining what God has blessed you with. People that don't have any vehicle or whatever. And they finally get the means and they get a car. It's like, oh, man, thank you, God. Thank you for, for providing this for me. This is going to be great. This is going to help me out a lot. And then all of a sudden it turns into, oh, well, this is just a piece of junk. This isn't that good. I wish I had that kind of car or that new car or whatever. Or I wish I had two cars, right? And then you get two cars. And you're like, oh, thank God. Wow, this is great. We can finally afford this. And my wife could have one. And I can have one. You do this. And then all of a sudden it's just, oh, there's always something wrong with it. There's, you know, and you get this complaining attitude because you get used to having it instead of retaining a thankful attitude. And God hates that. And anyone who's a parent understands a little bit about how God feels. When you work hard, mom and dad, you work hard, you provide food, you make meals, and the kid goes, I don't like this. I don't want to eat this. And that complaining attitude, it ought not to be tolerated. If we're going to raise our kids right, it shouldn't be tolerated. God doesn't tolerate it. And we need to look in ourselves as well and make sure that we don't tolerate that from ourselves. 